Hello and welcome to the Political History of the United States, episode 1.9, Early Years of Jamestown. Before we get started for today, I want to address the fact that I have become aware of some audio issues throughout the last couple of episodes. I did everything I could to try to troubleshoot the problem and figure out what was going on, but ultimately decided that the best course was just to do a bit of an equipment upgrade, and the benefit from that too is that I'm going to hopefully sound a little bit better from this point out. So I want to thank you all for your patience if you had noticed the issues, and remember, I'm still learning exactly how to do this whole recording thing. We have spent the past two episodes discussing the founding of Jamestown. In our first episode, we took our settlers across the Atlantic, and then last time we discussed the other people who were already in Virginia, specifically the Powhatan Confederacy. Today, we are going to turn and look at those early years in North America for the English and the struggles that they would face. We know that the English are eventually going to prevail and come to dominate what would become the United States. However, during the early years of the Jamestown colony, that survival was hardly a guaranteed thing. After all, colonies had failed before. Beyond the spectacular failure of Roanoke during the 1580s, one must only look to the north in 1607 for another colony that was doomed to fail. The Virginia Company's other colony, the Popham Colony, would pack up in a home in June of 1608. So during these early years, the survival of the colony was a real and legitimate question. Those early years on the ground would further suggest that the Jamestown colony may not be a viable settlement. During the first year alone, more than three quarters of the colonists are going to end up dead. These stresses and hardships accumulate in the winter of 1609-1610 during what is now known as the Starving Time. Originally, I had planned to have this episode cover those early years as well as the starving time. However, as I got working on things, it became apparent that doing so would mean that this is going to end up becoming a much longer episode than I wanted to produce. So this week, we are going to focus on those early years right up to the winter of 1609-1610. We're going to look at the organization, or really rather the lack thereof, for the early colony and the effect that it had on the people. We will continue also to look at the relationship with the Powhatan peoples. Then, with this behind us, next week we will turn our attention to that winter of 1609, the starving time and all that it meant for these early colonists. Today, as we look back over 400 years to Jamestown, it is almost impossible for us to view the colony as anything other than a great success. After all, it is the place where the United States got started. We love the adventure story of the colonists seeking a better life and going forward to establish not just a colony, but in time, a nation. Really, it is the backbone that elementary school history is based upon. However, the reality is is the colony of Jamestown during those early years was as close to an unmitigated disaster as you could possibly get. Between 1607 and 1622, approximately 10,000 people made the journey to Jamestown. Only 2,000 of those people are actually going to survive. Of the original 104 people who made it to Jamestown in 1607, less than 40 are still alive nine months later. The difference between Jamestown and Roanoke is that Jamestown was able to resupply its colonists, whereas Roanoke was unable to replace the dead. The problems in Jamestown were nearly immediate. The first problem is something that we had discussed back in episode 1.7. The location of the colony was problematic for a few reasons. As discussed before, the island where the colony was located was a patch of swampy land. This meant that the one thing that the colonists were never short on were mosquitoes and the diseases that they brought. The location of the island also produced a particularly brackish form of water, especially during the summer. Combine that with the fact that the waste from the settlers mixed in with this local brackish water supply proved to be a haven for disease. With the mosquitoes and that mixture of salty, dirty, gross water, it led to an exceptionally high death toll. While disease and later food shortages are going to become the dominant storylines moving forward, the first concern that the colonists have to deal with is going to be that threat from the local Indians. Almost immediately upon arriving in Jamestown, tension between the Indians and the English boiled over into conflict. Aggression from Powhatan meant that the first order of business was establishing a fortification. What follows during those first two weeks after the founding of Jamestown is repeated attacks and aggression on the part of the Indians. On May 29th, Roughly two weeks after the founding of the colony, colonist Eustace Clovel was shot by the Indians hiding in the long grass. He would die about a week later. Attacks of this nature really exemplify to the English how much danger they are actually in. 
and it really does push them to get their fortification done as quickly as possible. For at least that first month, therefore, getting the fort done was the top priority. By June 15th, the fort had been completed. The fort was triangular in shape, with cannons mounted at the three corners. The English had been embroiled in a long war against Ireland and had become pretty adept at this point of building this exact kind of fort. And this is good news for the English in the aspect that they were able to get their fort up and operating in only about a month's time. Following the completion of the fort, we begin to see the single biggest problem facing the colonists emerge. And that problem is where are they going to get their food from? These problems are going to grow so serious that by the time we reach the infamous winter of 1609, stories about cannibalism would begin to emerge. A serious shortage of food, however, is going to be a driving theme of our story as we move through these first couple of years. Keep in mind that when John Smith is captured by Powhatan in December of 1607, it was while he was out on an attempt to trade with the local Indians for food. Just moments ago, we had talked about the continuing aggression from the Indian tribes in the area. These tribes had not hesitated to kill any of the settlers before, and having to go trade with them now was not exactly a task that anybody really desired. If anything, however, this should show at least the initial desperation that the colonists had. Even if it meant risking personal safety, securing some kind of food trade was critical to the long-term survival of the colony. Problems with the food supply quickly became apparent to the colonists. About a week after the completion of the fort, Captain Newport set sail back to England in order to resupply. He had told the colonists that he would be back in about five months with new supplies. So, setting sail on June 22nd, the colonists were now left on their own. By this time, however, the colonists had already found it necessary to reduce their normal diet. Storing grain long-term, especially well at sea, was especially a daunting task during the 1600s. And by the time that Newport leaves, the grain had become infested with worms. At this point, the diet the settlers were eating was reduced to just rations of boiled wheat and barley while they waited for Newport to return. What makes this situation so serious for the colonists is that, obviously, this is not the first time people have ever crossed the Atlantic. By this time, there is well over 100 years worth of people who have made the journey. And while transatlantic settlements are still new for the English, this isn't their first time either. Was nothing learned from Roanoke? The problem for the English during the early years is that this is going to prove to be a multifaceted issue. There is no one reason why things go so far south. Rather, it is going to be a collection of problems that are going to come together to ensure that the colony was killing its settlers off at an astronomical rate. The first problem is going to stem from the perception of the first settlers. The Virginia Company had done a very good job in producing their literature about Virginia. Virginia was portrayed as nothing short of a paradise, and we've already talked about news regarding the docile Indian tribes and the Indian women who were anxiously awaiting to throw themselves at Christian men. Beyond this, though, the company made economic promises as well. The standard promises of gold and riches throughout Virginia was abundant throughout all of the early literature. For some men, such as John Smith, the dream of finding the elusive Northwest Passage still remains. In many ways, the first people crossing the Atlantic were akin to the people during the gold rushes of the 1800s. There was a promise of riches, and they followed it. For those coming over to seek personal riches, the idea of having to farm in ten fields would have seemed like a complete waste of time. After all, you've got these docile Indians who would be more than happy to provide them with all the food and supplies that they need. And hey, even if the Indians balked, there are enough of these other people coming along on the trip that they could man the fields while I go out and seek treasure and gold. What really cemented these ideas is that coming over and securing these huge personal riches really is not something that's that far out of the question. The English had to look no further than the conquistadors. Stories of Cortes and the Spanish conquering the Aztecs was well known by this point, and many of the first settlers would have had this as something constantly on their mind. During those early years, searching for gold and other precious metals was of paramount importance. The problem is, though, that there really isn't much in the way of gold in Virginia. Some accounts say that the colonists were finding mica and sending back huge amounts of it to England. And mica, though it looks similar to gold, is certainly not gold. Upon arriving in England, the mica was typically deemed to be worthless, something that must have been an absolutely devastating blow to the colonists who believed that they were now rich. <laughs> 
Beyond the men who have no interest in working the land and are only interested in seeking a personal fortune, the colony suffered from another serious problem that would hamper the food supply moving forward. A lack of labor in the colony that had any real sense of how to farm was a very serious problem, and it meant that the colony was never able to produce an adequate amount of crops. This is a twofold issue during the early years. A deadly mixture of bad water and mosquito-borne illnesses ravaged the colony throughout 1607. These illnesses left too many weak and sick to work in any meaningful way. The secondary issue came from the problem of labor in the colony in general. We had talked back in episode 1.7 about the fact that the colonists who had come to Jamestown were a mixture of gentlemen, who were not used to the idea of having to work, and vagrants who had absolutely no farming skills whatsoever. The problem would ultimately become that the gentlemen had no interest in actually doing any of the work and just wanted to go explore and find gold. And even beyond that, these men had never worked in their lives. They had no idea how to run a farm or how to cultivate a crop. The vagrants, who were left to tend the land, were little better off. Most of these men had been beggars on the streets of London. Many of them had never actually seen a farm and would have been just as incapable of successfully growing a crop as the gentlemen that had made the trip. To make matters worse, during the early months of Jamestown, the colony was struck with a serious lack of leadership. Upon leaving England, a council of seven had been chosen to govern the colony in Virginia. The corporate charter of the Virginia Company laid out careful instructions on how this group of seven should operate and how they should run the colony. I would urge you against thinking that this council of seven was a true and functioning form of government in any way, however. While it was in charge of handing out justice and maintaining the day-to-day life, this is still very much just operating within a business structure. The members of the Council of Seven were more akin to middle management than they were any kind of an actual functioning parliament. Among the group of seven was Edward Wingfield, who drew the distinction of being elected the first president of the colony. Wingfield was an obvious choice to be the first president of this colony. Wingfield had been one of the original investors in it, and was one of the only investors, other than John Smith and his nominal investment, who went along to the colony in person and didn't just hang back in London waiting for the money to roll in. Well, an obvious choice to be the president of the colony, Wingfield would be met with everything from general contempt to outright hostility. The problem for Wingfield is that he failed to ever adapt to the realities of being in Virginia. The class divisions between the gentlemen and the laborers was already something that was causing problems. And rather than proposing a solution to the problem, Wingfield failed to even recognize that there was a problem to begin with. Wingfield himself would likely have made no effort to hide the fact that, as a gentleman, he was entitled to more than the peasantry of the colony. Wingfield would put this theory to test early on and found himself accused of gross mismanagement of the food stores. Wingfield was accused of taking more than his fair share while others in the colony starved to death. The other council members agreed with these concerns and drafted charges against him. Wingfield threw out several defenses and accusations. However, his primary defense was that the lower class citizens had no legal right to accuse him of anything. This argument fell short, and in September of 1607, Wingfield was relieved of his duties as president and was deported back to London. Following the end of Wingfield's presidency, the task of governing the colonies fell to John Ratcliffe. Ratcliffe had come across the Atlantic as the captain of the Discovery. While a promotion to president is generally something to be celebrated, for Ratcliffe it would prove to be something of a disaster. Ratcliffe's tenure as president would see high amounts of death and disease. Colonist George Percy wrote during that time, that the settlers that were still living were in tents and holes in the ground. Percy described hearing the moaning of the colonists as they lay dying throughout the night. Things did look up a bit in January of 1608 when Captain Newport made his long-awaited return, about five weeks after his promised return. What Newport returned to was shocking. Only 38 out of that group of 104 settlers were still alive. Last time we had discussed Powhatan's miscalculation when dealing with the English colonists, and that constant conveyor belt of settlers that the English had the ability to send to North America. This conveyor belt kicks in with Newport's return. Along with supplies, Newport brought with him an additional 120 settlers. This means that despite the massive amount of death and disease, the colonists ended January of 1608 with a net gain of 54 colonists. 
this would be an ongoing theme for the colony. Regardless of how bad things got, the English were always able to replace their numbers. A few months later in April, another 51 settlers would reach the colony. And it is worth noting that among the second set of 51 settlers are the first women to make the trip. Radcliffe's time as president was just as short as Wingfield's. In July of 1608, Radcliffe's tenure of the presidency ended. During his tenure as the leader of the colony, Radcliffe continued to deal with disease and death. And therefore, it should not come as a surprise that Radcliffe was a very unpopular leader. Next up on the big stage was John Smith, and he is going to take over the colony and finally get it onto a somewhat solid footing. Smith was met with a mixed reaction in the colony. In his later writings, Smith would show contempt towards the people coming to Jamestown with the sole intention of searching for gold. Smith complained that these men were contributing nothing to the colony and rather sought nothing but their own personal riches. Quickly after assuming power in the colony, Smith instituted a minimum six hours per day in the field rule. The punishment for violating the minimum six-hour workday was quite simple. If you don't work, you don't eat. The policy was met with general contempt throughout the colony. The gentlemen in the colony viewed this as completely outside of what they were there for. They were accustomed to such work and had really no intention to do it. And furthermore, working the field for six hours per day? Well, that's six hours per day when they're not going to be able to go out and seek gold and riches. Smith would frequently complain about the low quality of labor he was seeing, complaining that the worst of London had been sent with him to Virginia. Despite a widespread dislike of the policies and practices of John Smith, the colony actually moved in the direction of self-sufficiency during 1608. In fact, by the time 1609 rolled around, Smith had managed to plant 30 acres of corn. The colony increased their amount of livestock, and things were generally looking up. And while the colony itself was seeing better times and was on the road to self-sufficiency, it was during this period that we see relations with the Powhatan Confederacy begin to sour. The question shifts, therefore, to why were the relations beginning to so seriously deteriorate? During his time as president, John Smith had done much to make the colony more self-sufficient. However, the fact remained that the colonists were still hanging on by just a thread. During the summer of 1608, Smith did everything he could to collect as much corn as possible from Powhatan. Smith made clear that his beliefs were that the Powhatan people owed him the corn and that if they didn't willingly provide it, he had few qualms with simply seizing it. Smith, in his role, had some success in trading with Powhatan. Smith's tactic was to essentially force the Powhatan Confederacy into the paradigm of European court. During a conversation with Powhatan's brother, Opashenkanau, Smith reminded him that it is fit for a king to keep his promises. The problem with this, however, is that to call Powhatan a king was to elevate him to something higher than what Smith would have ever intended. Whether or not Smith knew this is unclear, but his ultimate goal of the Virginia Company was to convert Powhatan into a vassal state of England. It seems unlikely that Smith would have viewed Powhatan as anything less than a future subject of the young English empire. For Smith, however, he had little choice. His people remained dependent on Powhatan, and at least to this point, Smith maintained the best overall relation with an Indian leader amongst the group. It shouldn't come as a surprise, then, that the starving time comes immediately following John Smith's departure from Jamestown. For Powhatan, this presents him with dual problems as well. It can be speculated that his initial agreement to provide corn to Jamestown came on the basis of him exerting power. What better way to contain a colony than become the food supplier? It provides protection for Powhatan and his people because the English colonists would be hesitant to kill the people who are feeding them. Likewise, should the Powhatan Confederacy come under attack from another source, he would have a powerful ally in the English. The English could not allow Powhatan to lose power. They at least had a manageable relationship with him and would be positioned to have to protect him from potential enemies. Finally, should Powhatan want to curb the growth or even eliminate the colony, he had control over their food supply. If he cuts off the English, the problem is easily solved. They're going to starve to death and die. But for Powhatan, it appears that he has underestimated the amount of corn that the colonists were going to require. Remember that the Powhatan people were semi-nomadic. They were a people used to having to ration food. 
Well, they did have a certain amount of surplus that they used to trade and used to get through the difficult times. They lacked the ability to be the sole supplier to the English. At best, the ability of Powhatan was providing supplemental food supplies. In December of 1608, Smith met with Powhatan and engaged in a tense negotiation with him. Powhatan knew that the English were hungry and depended on him for food. Powhatan offered to trade with them, but demanded that the price be paid in stealing guns. Now, for the English, that appears to have stood as their line in the sand. While they showed willingness to negotiate and trade, there is a strong reluctance to provide Powhatan with weapons. The English were well aware that the weapons provided in trade to Powhatan could well end up being used against them in a future conflict. According to John Smith, following a stirring speech where he vowed to never cease seeking revenge should Powhatan not provide for Jamestown, yet would remain a close friend if he did, Powhatan relented and agreed to trade a small amount of corn on this occasion without getting weapons back in return. The truth of whether or not the speech ever took place is absolutely debatable. With a significant language barrier still existing between Powhatan and Smith, it seems unlikely that Smith could have delivered such a speech effectively. Likewise, there does seem to be the widespread question about the veracity of Smith's claims in later writings. As previously discussed, John Smith was not above embellishing. Regardless of the circumstances, however, Powhatan does make clear through these and future interactions that his continued support of the English was not a sustainable model. Powhatan informed Smith that should the English get more aggressive, he would remove his people and hide deep in the woods, where the English would not be able to reach him. This wasn't an idle threat either from Powhatan. As previously discussed, this group was semi-nomadic. They had moved before and they would ultimately move again. For the English, pushing too hard meant potential starvation. Making matters worse for the English, in October of 1609, Smith would suffer a very serious burn. John Smith used this as an excuse to give up the presidency and return to London. Smith would never again return to North America. By this point, John Smith had become deeply unpopular amongst the other colonists. Smith struggled with mutinous colonists and often found himself fighting to keep the colony under control. Despite this, however, one of the places that Smith does seem to excel in his dealings is with Powhatan. Smith and Powhatan certainly have a tense relationship, but it is Smith who seemed to have some understanding of his positions. Following Smith's exit, the colony was left in the hands of George Percy. George Percy is going to have far less luck dealing with Powhatan. These poor relationships are best exemplified from an incident that took place in December of 1609. With food supplies seriously dwindling and Powhatan not supplying the colony with food, the English decided to take a more aggressive stance. Led by John Ratcliffe, a plan was struck to help strong-arm Powhatan into giving more food. Now, before you ask, yes, we did in the era of Ratcliffe as the leader of the colony in this episode, so none of this is actually going down during that time where he's leading the colony. However, John Ratcliffe did remain in Jamestown and, at least for a few more minutes, is going to remain a prominent colonist. So, what was this great plan? Well, it appears that in order to get Powhatan to work with him, Ratcliffe and his group went ahead and took two of Powhatan's children hostage. It is unclear if these were actually physical children of Powhatan or rather were just children of his tribe. Regardless, however, Ratcliffe was attempting to procure food through a new and more aggressive style of negotiation. And I think it can go completely without saying here that Powhatan was not amused by these new tactics. Powhatan invited Ratcliffe and his party to come meet with him to discuss providing the colony with food. And upon reaching Powhatan's settlement, Ratcliffe released the boy and the girl whom he had taken into custody. Powhatan, however, had no intention to simply let a challenge to his sovereignty go without a challenge. Needing to make clear that he was not going to simply provide corn on demand, Powhatan lured the colonists into a trap. The men who had accompanied Ratcliffe to meet Powhatan were summarily executed. One man did manage to escape back to the boats that Ratcliffe and his men had traveled on. Those who remained aboard the boats managed to get back to Jamestown safely. For John Ratcliffe, though, this is going to mark the end of the line for him. Powhatan captured him much the same as he had John Smith back in 1608. However, unlike with John Smith, there was nobody there to save him. There was not a ceremonial adoption, just torture and an execution. According to the sources, Ratcliffe was tied naked to a tree 
and a large fire was lit before him. Ratcliffe was then skinned alive and forced to watch as the skin was thrown into the fire. Finally, Powhatan had Ratcliffe burned. So, yeah, that is actually pretty awful. The incident left absolutely no doubt as to Powhatan's stance. He no longer had interest in sustaining the colonists and rather sought to exert his own personal sovereignty. Powhatan viewed the English as a threat and had no interest in helping them survive. He wanted the English gone. I want to finish up this week by talking briefly about some of the other changes that were happening to the colony during this time. These changes are going to have a major effect on the future direction of the colony and is going to help explain some of the hardships that are coming. The Virginia Company had come to the conclusion that the current governance of Jamestown just was not working. The Council of Seven voting to elect a president had yielded nothing but death and disease. The colony was absolutely nowhere close to profitability and was basically just hemorrhaging money. The English, despite their best attempts, were dying at a rate as fast as the English could send new settlers across the Atlantic, where they were probably going to die as well. With this in mind, the Virginia Company concluded that the council system was not going to be an efficient way to either make the company profitable or help extend English influence in North America. As a response to this, the company concluded that the best strategy would be to institute a more absolute system of government inside the colony. Instead of a quasi-democratic council, the company wanted to transition to a one-man rule system. The company decided that the officers would become governors of the provinces. Each governor would be given the power to manage the land, as well as interpret and enforce the law. Most importantly, the individual governors were tasked with the job of enforcing the policies of the Virginia Company. What these changes are ultimately going to mean is that the colony will move from what had been the relative chaos to a much more structured colony under a near-military-style rule. At the same time, the Virginia Company was changing how they issued stock. The company offered new shares, however, they were unable to issue dividends, as the colony at this point was operating at very deep losses. Instead, in order to sell shares, the Virginia Company sold the stock by offering shareholders profits by the land. For an investment of just £12.5, a shareholder would get profits from a 100-acre plot of land. This is going to mark the beginning of private land ownership in the English colonies. Finally, the Virginia Company did at least realize that part of the problem with the colony had been the low quality of recruits. Recall in episode 1.7, we had talked about how many of the initial recruits to go to London were vagrants off the street, something we talked about earlier again today as well. In fact, it was seen as an easy solution to the growing homeless problem in London. Just shift the increasingly homeless population off to the faraway land of Virginia. Of course, this meant that in the colony itself, you have a group of settlers who were completely unprepared for the reality of life in Virginia. This is something that the governors now sought to move away from and bring some more skilled settlers in for control. The new governor of the colony was a Lord Delaware. Delaware had some troubles in 1601 when he had been accused of supporting a failed attempt on the life of Elizabeth. These charges were ultimately dropped. And just as a quick side note that you can share with all your family and friends, Delaware's great-grandmother was Mary Boleyn, the sister of Anne Boleyn. So, see, everybody here is related. Upon becoming governor, Lord Delaware decided that he wasn't feeling great and decided that it was better to send his lieutenant governor instead. Sir Thomas Gates, a veteran of the English campaign in the Netherlands, set out to take command of the struggling Jamestown colony. Gates did not travel lightly. Coming along with him were nine ships and 500 men. This was by far the largest trip ever made to the Virginia colony to that date. Unfortunately for Gates, the trip proved to be a difficult one. Of his nine ships, one of them was lost at sea and another ran aground in Bermuda. Problematically, the ship that did run aground in Bermuda happened to be the ship that Gates himself was on. This means that when the seven other ships arrived and 300 new settlers were in Virginia in August of 1609, Sir Thomas Gates was not among them. When John Smith leaves Jamestown in the early fall of 1609, the colony had between 300 and 400 settlers, and they were under the command of a man who was shipwrecked in Bermuda. The colony was now in command of George Percy, who was left with the impossible task of leading a struggling colony through what would be the most trying challenges that they had yet faced. In two weeks' time, we are going to get into that winter of 1609-1610.
the period that has become known as the Starving Time is going to mark the low point for the Virginia colony, and nearly dooms them to the exact same fate as the Roanoke colonists some 30 years before. So with that, I will see you back here in two weeks' time, and we will begin to address the Starving Time in detail. Thank you for listening, and I look forward to seeing you back here in two weeks.